Today's episode is sponsored by Wilia, creating flexible workforce solutions for modern businesses. Visit them at wilia.com. Aerospace and defense manufacturing. Machines and automation. Additive manufacturing. Smart manufacturing. The global manufacturing economy. Welcome to Advanced Manufacturing Now, the podcast for manufacturing professionals, powered by SME. From the design screen to the shop floor to final assembly, we drive the conversation about making manufacturing smarter by connecting people who are passionate about manufacturing. Hello, and welcome to Advanced Manufacturing Now, the podcast for manufacturing professionals. I'm Amy Bryson, contributing lead editor of Smart Manufacturing Magazine. Today, we'll be talking about something that is top of mind for many of our listeners, and that is how to achieve flexibility for frontline workers in manufacturing. And my guest is Rahil Siddiqui, founder and CEO of Wilia, and a veteran manufacturing HR leader with more than 14 years of experience. And after earning a master's in industrial and labor relations from Cornell University, Rahil built a career at Fortune 500 companies, including TE Connectivity and GE. In his most recent role, he served as the HR business partner to the chief supply chain officer at a $14 billion manufacturing company where he saw firsthand the evolving challenges facing the frontline workforce. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Rahil, and welcome to the show. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And as I mentioned, today's discussion couldn't be more timely. Um, As you well know, manufacturers are facing unprecedented labor challenges, including everything from demographic shifts and skills gaps to changing worker expectations. And, and before we jump into our discussion, can you give our listeners a bit more background about yourself and really what inspired you to start Wilia? Absolutely. My pleasure being on here. Um, so my name is Rahil Siddiqui. I uh, started off in life as a computer science engineer uh, growing up in India and made the transition into HR while I worked for GE um, and transitioned into HR because I worked in a call center environment where we had, uh, believe it or not, a lot of similar dynamics from a demographic and uh, labor uh, shortage type challenges, which we experienced in the last couple of years in manufacturing. So I was influenced by some terrific uh, HR leaders and got educated on how HR influenced the uh, outcomes when it came to talent attraction, retention, and and dealing with uh, a whole lot of churn uh, in that industry. Cutting forward a few years, um, I moved uh, into the HR team with GE, went and educated myself in the world of industrial and labor relations, uh, as you referenced earlier, and started working for a terrific uh, industrial manufacturer here in the U.S. in uh, uh, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Texas, had a stint in Paris, um, and spent a, a lot of time in a lot of different manufacturing environments. Did a lot of frontline HR work, did a lot of uh, HR technology work, m and work, etc. Grew through this uh, uh, company, and the last role I held, um, I was the HR guy to the chief supply chain officer and the chief operating officer, um, which meant I had a pretty good a bird's eye view to the manufacturing network that incorporated over a hundred factories globally, which employed over fifty thousand frontline workers. Oh wow! Right, and luckily for me, I was uh, in this role uh, through the pandemic lockdowns. Right, so we all know what we went through as we <laughs> went into that period, and then what uh, what happened on the other side uh, of the lockdowns while uh, we searched for these essential workers to come and work on the factory floor. So I actually have a pretty exciting uh, story and and how this all came about and the inspiration. Uh, It it, it was truly one line in one CNN article that I happened to read on a Monday. And approximately the next Monday after that, I had quit a job that I'd held for over 12 years. That's how quickly it happened. Wow. Wow. 
what so was that probably line? wondering what this one line yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, that, like i'm waiting and hear <laughs> what that line was so powerful to cause you to change your life absolutely that's and that's the right word right go jumping headfirst into the world of entrepreneurship uh changed a lot of things uh in in my life and my family's life um couldn't have been happier to to make that plunge with uh, the support of the family uh so, so the one line essentially was the, the article in CNN was actually written about the state of the labor market, um, and I recall it was uh, in response to one of the monthly jobs reports that had just uh, come out, um, and and buried deep inside this uh, article about the state of the labor market is this line uh, that says, "Yeah, things are bad in the labor market out there, but." Millions of more women are expected to leave the workforce in the coming months due to a lack of flexibility in their jobs. I'm sitting there thinking, okay, I worked for a phenomenal company for over a decade, seen it through and through from implementing SAP HR systems uh, across multiple countries all the way down to the factory floor in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, dealing with frontline labor challenges. A uh, great company walks the walk, talks the talk when it comes to diversity, inclusion, engagement, and and we're living in this post-pandemic uh, world where flexibility is being uh, demanded by every worker out there. And I sit there scratching my head, wondering, okay, so what does that flexibility look like for that frontline factory worker? Uh, so that's that's what I obsessed over for the next uh, few days, and uh, about a week or so later, I went in, quit, uh, and started building uh, the company that is now Willia. Wow, that's an amazing story. I mean, I think it's you know that that pilot light was lit within you to you really had some some strong beliefs and and uh, answering that question, and certainly you're helping to answer that question. So. You know, through this journey, what surprising insights have you gained about frontline manufacturing work? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the early days, uh, just to continue on that thread a little bit, right, uh, was a lot of uh, research, a lot of talking to people. Uh, obviously, I brought the industry knowledge and context with me um, after having spent, uh, you know, my professional career uh, in that space. But um the whole premise and the thesis here was that women need more flexibility uh, to show up uh, and, and, and do frontline work. So to your point, uh, maybe I'll say two sort of surprising things that I discovered in those early days. One, the gig economy. Let, let's address that for a moment. I live in middle America. Right. So at this point in time in this narrative, I'm in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Um, it, um, uh, you know, the early days uh, coming out of the pandemic uh, life. And, and, and right prior to then, if you talked about Uber or Lyft drivers in middle America, that wasn't really a thing. Right. It's um, you either had your own car or you were taking the bus. You're really not taking a whole lot of Uber rides anywhere here. But it turns out people like me living in middle America through the COVID lockdowns became used to ordering their lunches and dinners and groceries home. So one of this, these inadvertent consequences of that lockdown period was this hastening of the gig economy in middle America, not in the coasts, not in those big cities, but uh, in those smaller towns. And one of the points of surprise for me was, as I was researching this, there was a wait list of people who wanted to drive for DoorDash. And this is exactly the same time when factories and warehouses and, and distribution centers were struggling to attract even those three, five, ten people to come in and, you know, join their workforce. Well, so that was a big insight there. And then on the sort of on the opposite end of that uh, early insights into this space was um, as, as we started making progress, getting uh, our product in the hands of um, uh, the in uh, frontline supervisors in the industrial supply chain, uh, we knew it would unlock a net new talent pool of people who want to work flexible hours. 
that that was known. So we were not surprised by the fact that there were three to 10 times more people who wanted to work truly flexible hours. Now, what did come as a surprise was sometimes the demographic makeup of the folks who showed up. Um, so just to paint a certain stereotype here, we started running into middle-aged white men who showed up over and over for looking for such flexible frontline work. And we, we sat there wondering why. So we decided to go talk to them. And, and we spoke to a bunch of people, and, and it turns out, lo and behold, um, these are people who may have a full-time job somewhere, but are looking to take on a little bit more, right? And they may not be looking for another entire second full-time job, but they are looking uh, to pick up hours here and there as it makes sense to them because make up a reason. I'm expecting that second baby. I'm expecting to buy that boat next year. I'm expecting to buy that home next year and and so on and so forth. So, uh, and that's where it all came together that uh, yes, the gig economy is a secular trend. Yes, there is some latent labor capacity in our systems, but there is that persona of that manly men of middle America who will never go and deliver your burrito for lunch in their Ford 150. But ask them to move that 50-pound box on the factory floor. They're absolutely game for it. So so some interesting early insights there for you. Yeah, that is interesting. And, and you know, as we were heading into today's discussion, I was giving it some thought. And, and you know, we do see flexibility everywhere. Well, this notion of flexibility as as a um, reality, you know, you mentioned the Uber example, you in through the pandemic, even office jobs where people were given an opportunity to work from home, but for frontline workers, that's just simply not really possible. So what else do we mean when we say what flexibility means to workers when we're talking specifically about frontline workers? That's a great question, right? So uh, we, we've referenced a little bit of this. We've started scratching at the surface. Um, so how do we define flexibility uh, for frontline workers? And so we obviously spend a lot of time uh, thinking about that question, and, and we formed a thesis here. And I'll frame it as um, the ability for frontline workers to uh, determine three things. When I work, how much I work, and what do I work on, right? So, so I'll say that again. When I work, how much I work, and what do I work on? So if, as, as we start digging into um, uh, that sort of thesis and, and connect it to the previous set of examples and the gig economy, uh, you, you, you relatively quickly are able to sort of uh, figure out that, you know, when I work, I, I need that flexibility to pick and choose uh, shifts or times, right, and, and slots where I can uh, set my work to revolve around my life and not the other way around. So, so you figure out, okay, we've, we've got to let people be a little bit more flexible in, in when they work. Now, how much I work, right? So, so here as we start unpacking, we think about um, do we have all full-time employees here or is there an, an, an element of uh, part-time work, gig work, flex work, whatever you want to call it, right? So are we able to help people balance how much they're able to work? Or is it a, truly a one-size-fits-all, right? I mean, think about this from the lenses of inclusivity um, and the world of supply chain has almost, almost always said, you know, it's our way or the highway. Like this, this is how you get to work or we have nothing else for you. And, and so we've uh, had our doors closed for a big chunk of the population in the communities in which we operate. And then the last bit um, uh, of what I work on Interestingly, we actually have some evidence and some muscle memory around this um, in, in the industrial supply chain. And, and I'll reference our uh, intrinsic sort of um, uh, drive to cross-train and cross-kill our workers. So there, there has been lip service done to a lot of cross-training and cross-killing initiatives, um, and this fundamentally makes your workforce more flexible and more agile. And, and now, by the way, I'm using that flexible word from the point of view of managers of these facilities, right? If I have a cross-trained workforce, then I can flexibly deploy people 
into the right job at the right time. But how does the worker have a little bit of a voice uh, and buy in into what they get trained on and what they get to perform as work on a given day or a week, etc. So, so that's sort of how we're measuring and, and looking at moving the needle on to make those more flexible work outcomes uh, to take shape on the front lines. When I work, how much I work, and what do I work on? That makes sense. And and how do you, or let me rephrase that, why do or why should manufacturers and employers care about having flexibility for front, frontline workers? I mean, the obvious question is what's in it for them? Absolutely, right? It's uh, if, if we can't uh, make the case for unlocking more flexible work options on the front lines, this will sort of always end up being this um, uh, touchy-feely, HR-driven aspiration um, uh, and, and, and not so much how does it connect to my top line or my bottom line. So uh, we, we've already touched on a few of these uh, elements. So uh, when, when we think about flexible work options, uh, be it of the part-time variety where we are looking at a net new pool of people who can come and uh, uh, be sort of an addendum to your existing labor model, um, so so in, in those types of situations, we consistently see 3x to 10x more applicants for flex work than additional full-time equivalents of those exact same jobs. So we've done a lot of A-B testing here um, as we were getting started. And since then, with dozens and dozens of factories with roles ranging uh, across the skill spectrum, we see this over and over. And and intuitively, it, it makes sense that there are people in our communities who have good work ethic, dependable, reliable, but simply not looking for full-time work or all the bells and whistles that come with full-time work, be it insurance and pension programs and 401ks, et cetera, right? Because they're likely not the primary breadwinner, et cetera. So again, to reiterate, we're not looking to change the established labor model. We're looking at expanding that pool of uh, workers. So that's number one. Number two, we uh, talked a little bit about the ability to cross-train and cross-skill people in real time. So when we think about um, uh, a skills matrix for uh, existing full-time employees in a, a factory or a warehouse, we tend not to operationalize that skills matrix. We, we tend to think of it as a static Excel sheet that is a little bit of a living document maybe um, and and then try and measure this once in a while or pull it out when there's an ISO audit. And so our philosophy around this is if we can take that skills matrix, digitize it, operationalize it, and truly deploy people as and when needed a real time, then we have now given plant managers and, and general managers of warehouses uh, an additional lever of agility that uh, is usually not uh, uh, available uh, when you don't have the right uh, digital tools. You can always run uh, a lot of what we are talking about using Excel sheets, sending messages, picking up the phone, texting, etc. But what we've now come to learn through a lot of experimenting here is that for truly flexible work options to be sustainable and scalable, we have to start by digitizing skills. So what what that essentially means is, let's take a simple example and connect the dots. If I sit here and say, hey, I need four extra people in the warehouse this weekend, I have this sort of amorphous idea of a warehouse associate or, or senior warehouse associate or warehouse associate one, two, three, whatever the job titling schema might be um, at an employer versus being able to say, hey, I need two people who can pick and pack, one person who can run that labeling machine and one person who's going to ride the forklift. That is how frontline supervisors think about talent and and the people who work uh, in their teams versus thinking of job titles. So that's sort of the granular skills first approach to flexibility that we evangelize. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Can you 
Can you uh, give our listeners just a bit of context around how this is being received by both employees and employers? Do you have, you know, specific examples or stories to share? Absolutely. There's uh, some, uh, as, as you can imagine, the on the employee side of the house, um, there's so many heart-wrenching stories of uh, first-time moms in some cases, in some cases primary caretakers um, or, or, or recent retirees uh, who come right back into the workforce um, because they, they were forced to leave because there was nothing that worked for their life circumstance. And, and we get absolutely heartening stories of these folks coming back into the world of the employed, but at the point in life where they are, this is all that they are looking for, right? Hard time, flexible work options. Now, when we switch over to the employer side of the house, um, we uh, see a lot of good uh, response around, hey, uh, we were never able to use that skills matrix the right way in the past. So so we're super happy to actually take this and better deploy existing full-time people. I'll use a very simple example. Um, we did a back of uh, the napkin type of map with um, one of our customers. That uh, They have about 400 employees in uh, their facility. And uh, they have a very healthy culture of moving people uh, between departments and between buildings on their campus. So we did a rough math of, hey, do we think about five people move across teams and bid for various jobs, get promoted, and, and, and move around in your ecosystem? Five a month. And they laugh and they say, yes, it's way more than five, but let's go with five. And so now as you start extrapolating that, if five people each month are moving across teams, that's 60 in a year, or about 180 over three years. What you're saying is in a three-year period, de facto, 40% of your workforce is cross-trained. But because we don't have the ability to keep track of those skills that have permeated the organization, and in some cases, there's a certain half-life to these skills, right? So that has to be taken into account as well, not something that Excel sheets do a good job of. So, so these are sort of the elements that employers are looking at and considering, hey, we haven't done justice to the human capital that works for us and and keep those uh, skills uh, alive, uh, keep that cross-training uh, uh, muscle memory uh, alive. And so th those are some really cool outcomes that employers uh, are experiencing in addition to you know uh, uh, unlocking a net new pool of talent when they opt in to some of those uh, flexible part-time type job options. Those two things are interlinked from a digitization standpoint, right? So using Excel sheets, that's only so much you can do. But once you have a digital skills matrix with the ability to real-time schedule, communicate, et cetera, you, you're, you now are able to do both things, more efficiently deploy existing full-time people. And number two, tap into a net new pool of uh, flexible uh, workforce that uh, uh, you decide how much or how little uh, uh, you, you need the the delta on a day-to-day, week-to-week uh, type of basis. Uh, and and the last thing I will add there is um, so some of some of the uh, so examples that bring all this together for us were when people who st at that current point in time were looking for only flexible part-time options. Lives change, circumstances change, and they essentially, when the time is right, come in, have the conversation with their employer, and essentially now go become full-time employees, but when they are ready for it, right? So so th th this journey of uh, building a flex worker pool, using that as uh, a funnel to eventually uh, landing your full-time employees has become a very uh, terrific, uh, virtuous cycle that we are seeing with some employers. Yeah, that's definitely an upside. And and you mentioned this relationship between kind of automation and the flexible, you know, human workforce with the cross training that is enabled by these flexible arrangements. I mean, that really gives not just the worker but the manufacturer 
a leg up and getting ahead of the curve and integrating, you know, automation AI and, you know, the human element. How do you see that evolving in manufacturing? I mean, that's really at the heart of what we talk about a lot when it comes to digitization and smart manufacturing. Absolutely. I mean, the, b both these trends um, are, are fairly secular at this point. More automation, more robotics, and the next generation looking for more flexibility, right? And, and to be fair, it's um, not just the next generation. Um, looking back at this time in 20, 30 years, the, the want and need of more flexibility on the front lines this will almost be looked at as the five-day work week, right? Uh, when we look back 30, 50 years ago, um, uh, we would probably sit here and wonder, okay, what was all that, uh, you know, hue and cry over? Yeah, of course, it had to be a five-day work week. Um, and and so th that's sort of that period of flux that we are in right now. Um, and, and so as we think about... Um, more automation and and and, and more um, uh, tech enablement from a robotic standpoint, we sort of see that consistent with tech enabling your frontline workforce, be it your supervisors or your frontline employees themselves, and and get and becoming more agile and and better prepared for wherever this new future of work is headed. One of the potential outcomes, if we just play this out a little bit. That that many of your listeners probably already experiences. Uh, we call this internally the the donutization of the workforce, right? So uh, as as you get more and more of um, uh, uh, robotics and automation showing up in in these factories, of course you need more people who actually understand how to troubleshoot it and maintain it and and, and be those uh, robotic techs. And, and that's going to take a lot of um, uh, skill trade type uh, re-education. And then on the other hand, you're going to have a whole lot of people who are just there because guess what? H humans still have a bit of a leg up on uh, our uh, robot uh, friends. And and so not a whole lot of work to be done on their part, but but be that uh, adult in the room while the robots do their thing, right? So so you you end up having sort of this bifurcation in terms of the skills uh, base. So very uh, highly skilled uh, techs who are maintaining and, and and making sure the machines do what they're supposed to, and and then uh, some not very skilled folks who are just in the room and 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 keeping things going uh, uh, according to plan from a uh, uh, monitoring the robot standpoint, and so. So now as you think about how are we accounting for that skills transfer and, and documenting the skills and being able to deploy the right person with the right skill to the right uh, job at the right time, that's where, again, the, the tech enablement on the front lines continues to remain very um, uh, relevant and, and, and a very pressing need. Uh, so so I, I would say both those trends kind of go in the same direction and, and require uh, the same level of tech enablement um, uh, of the frontline worker. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense as well. And I'm sure in your discussions with manufacturers that are concerned about quality and consist consistency with variable staffing, I mean, how do you see the successful companies um, who are doing it right maintain those standards while being able to offer more flexible work options that are benefiting both their bottom line and the the frontline workforce. Great question. So many times when we speak with manufacturers and talk about uh, exploring a part time component of uh, their workforce, rightfully we we get a lot of discomfort um, because if you think about it, there's a certain way things have been done in the industrial supply chain for decades, if not centuries. And we're talking about uh, sort of um, uh, going against the grain there. So my advice there would be start small, see what works, and every factory is different, right? If, if you've spent any time in the world of manufacturing, you know uh, each, th th there's no two same factories. So, so there's a lot of things uh, from your SNOP profile to your sort of skills uh, makeup, your demographic makeup of the factory, leadership, uh, 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 drive, et cetera. E each of these um, uh, unique characteristics will lead to slightly different preferences. 
But what you cannot afford to do is continue with business as usual. This was the primary primary impetus for me to walk away from that uh, job of uh, doing HR and manufacturing because that's what I noticed that we were kind of trying to brute force our way into solving the labor challenge on the front lines when we needed to take a step back and, and think about, okay, let's explore the art of the possible here. And, and so my advice there would be start small, explore what works, and then expand on things that make sense to you. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, a lot has happened in the past few years with uh, the labor shortages, and you know we're facing more of that. If you fast forward a, a few years ahead, or even five years, where do you see this going, and and what opportunities and challenges do you see existing with manufacturers? So there's a lot of great data out there. Um, I, I think the one of the most common numbers I see um, uh, as we fast forward five, ten years out. Uh, I think is from uh, a report that Deloitte had put out there saying we'll be short of about 2.1 million workers um, by 2030. And uh, if I'm not wrong on the timing of that report, I think that was before we put the, w- w- before uh, the U.S. had passed the Infrastructure uh, Act or, or, or the CHIPS Act, which, you know, sort of further emboldened American manufacturing. So, so I wonder if that 2.1 million number is a little bit of an undercount. Uh, so, so as we look into the future, um, thankfully, we're experiencing a little bit of a respite compared to the last two years that we struggled through the front lines uh, uh, from a recruiting, attracting and retaining a talent standpoint. So, so now's a great time to be investing while things are a little bit quiet and calm. Now's a great time to be investing in and in building a little bit of that muscle memory that will be needed to get ready for that big demographic storm that's coming our way. Right. So um, lots more automation uh, to occur, but given the nature of the supply chain and, and uh, depending on the type of uh, uh, high mix, low volume types of factories that may be out there, this would be a terrific time to sort of uh, expand our horizons and see what else is possible from uh, uh, being more inclusive of the communities in which we work. And it all starts by in our humble opinion, starts by digitizing the skills matrix and and, and then uh, looking at a number of uh, internal policies, uh, processes, practices, and norms. And, and uh, that's uh, where the uh, operations leadership uh, uh, of these factories and warehouses has a, a leading sort of uh, role to play in uh, in imbibing those changes. And uh, if you have any HR listeners, then they get to bring some thought leadership to bear and uh, drive home the point that this is something that is truly a win-win for for everybody, the the internal stakeholders, the external community members who then uh, become uh, available as a, a net new talent pool. Yeah. I mean, in this what you've outlined, it really does make the case that flexibility equals resiliency. And the one thing that we know is that manufacturers need to be prepared for uh, many variables. The pandemic was a great example of that. And I think, you know, being prepared now for the future uh, makes this the business case for this um, investment in this strategic vision makes a lot of sense. Um, so speaking of the future, is there what's going on in the future with Willia? Do you have any milestones coming up? Uh, what what is it that you and your team are working on? Absolutely. So, um, as I stated, we uh, live and breathe uh, the front lines of the industrial supply chain. So, we're doing some really cool work around uh, digitizing the good old skills matrix, which we've always struggled on the front lines to keep updated. And after a lot of uh, conversations and a lot of um, uh, product uh, design uh, development and evolution, uh, we've managed to put our finger on why it is so notoriously difficult to keep that skills matrix uh, updated through our frontline supervisors. And sometimes it comes down to uh, something as simple as what's in it for me? And uh, so we've talked a lot about some of these big, broad themes of you know flexibility and agility and being inclusive, et cetera, et cetera. 
But if it all comes down to being able to know who can do what kind of work, where in the factory, it could, comes back to that good old skills matrix. Why is it not updated? Because there typically is no what's in it for me, for that poor frontline supervisor. Right? You, you, you may have a plant manager who is very excited about cross-training his or her workforce, but um, if the supervisor doesn't see the what's in it for me, then the, typically it's, uh, it's, it's not going to be a living document. It's going to be one of those uh, biannual exercises or, or annual ISO-driven uh, exercise of uh, keeping uh, of, of a last-ditch effort to update that skills matrix. So, so our uh, take on this is if we can put tools in the hands of supervisors that allow them to operationalize that skills matrix, allow them to reach out to the right worker at the right time, uh, and give them the confidence and conviction that when they need someone to ride that forklift, that's exactly who they get. If they need somebody to go use that labeling machine, then that's exactly the person that you get. So building that confidence and conviction while operationalizing that digital skills matrix with a smart scheduling solution layered on top of the skills matrix, that that's what we're sort of fine-tuning and honing. And, um, and, and our uh, uh, customers uh, seem to love that. And we're uh, pretty excited to bring on some uh, household name um, manufacturers in, uh, uh, onto the platform in, in, in the next few weeks. So uh, more uh, exciting news to come on that front uh, soon. Wonderful. And if our listeners want to learn more about the work you and your team are doing, where should they go? Great question. So you can visit willia.com. That's W-I-L-Y-A.com. We um, we rebranded from uh, having a different name earlier this year. So we're still getting the new name out there. And uh, willia.com should get you uh, to the latest and greatest about us. Well, Rahil Siddiqui, I want to thank you so much for taking time to join us and share your valuable insights with our listeners. And I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. Make sure to stay up to date about what's happening in advanced and smart manufacturing and hear more podcasts by visiting us at advancedmanufacturing.org. Take care, everybody.